Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Savvy Cast. This is Jamie, and I'm so thrilled that you're here today, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast. Okay, guys, I'm super excited about my guests today. I have Gina Pitts and Ellie Hiller, Ellie Torrance Hiller, my firstborn. Okay, and today, guys, they are going to share super helpful, practical advice particularly to women on healthy lifestyle choices and things that we can do to navigate midlife, perimenopause, menopause, and so forth. So ladies, welcome. And I want y'all to give a brief introduction, but first we are going to do our icebreaker question. What would you choose as your last meal? And Ellie, you've been on the podcast myriad times but I can't remember what you said. So what's your favorite? I change it. It changes weekly. My last meal would be, it's always your food. It would probably be your baby back ribs. Even though I Ooh, don't yes. like ribs, I love yeah. your ribs. So it's really, yeah. it would be that for sure. They're great. And guys, if you want the recipe, just Google family savvy ribs and it'll pull up. They really are great. They're so yummy oh, and they're so easy, good. easy. Yes. Gina, what about you? <laughs> I'm laughing because if you know me, you probably know what I'm going to say. I love oatmeal. And so I'm going to say if I had <laughs> my last meal ever, I would have cold oatmeal because I look forward to it every single morning. And I have the same breakfast that I've had for five years straight, but it's cold oatmeal with almond butter and berries on top. And I love it so much. And that was my last meal. That's awesome. That's interesting. <laughs> You'll have to share how you do that on your um, Instagram, which I do recommend. And I'm going to link to all the details about <laughs> Gina and Ellie and the Vulcan Nutrition, where they they both partner with clients and um, all of the things that we discuss. But I do want y'all to briefly just share with everyone your credentials for being able to share these things with us. So I have a master's in exercise science. I've worked in the fitness space for at least 10 years now. And I have a couple of certifications with how to train pain-free. I know that's a big thing, especially as we get older, people tend to have like nagging injuries. Maybe it's nothing major, but I've been certified with how you can actually train in a way that feels good for your body. Cause that that's so important. If something hurts, you're not going to want to do it. So how can you train safely in a way that feels good for your body? And then we, we both have a similar certification with nutrition. So that way we can at least give nutrition advice that, you know, we have actually learned, learned the material. So yes, I, uh, I have my bachelor's of science in nursing and I um, am a nutritionist, certified nutritionist through Healthy Steps Nutrition. And I um, have my CrossFit level one amongst a few other like fitness certifications. So we, we are partners in Vulcan Nutrition. So we both have individual clients that we work with separately. Uh, that's We've been doing that both for over, I've been doing it for you know five or six years now, Gina, multiple years. So um, you can look us up on Instagram, which we'll tag in the Yes, show. we'll tag. And um that's, is there a re, how would someone, um, is there like, if you're leaning more toward this topic, choose Gina, this topic, choose Ellie, or is, is there a differentiation that might be helpful for people who want to be a client, but don't know which one? Yeah, we, everyone will go through the same process of going through our website to submit their contact form. And then from there, Gina and I will, one of us will reach out to them and ask a few questions for a, on a free phone call. Oh. And if, if they say, just to get some more context, but if they say, Hey, I'm a mid, I'm a woman in midlife about to go through menopause or currently through menopause that always to me, I'm like, Gina, I send them straight to Gina. So, um, yeah, yeah. And that, and Gina, you can speak, Gina knows so much about it, but it's also just like the client she really also enjoys working with. Wonderful. Well, that is so helpful. Okay. Well, I put a Q and a on my story, my Instagram story, and we've looked at every one of those and we are addressing in some 
shape, form, or fashion, every question that was asked with one um, exception. My friends who asked about hormone replacement, we're going to just not really address that because that is so individualized between a woman and her doctor. So everything else, though, we will be addressing. So guys, I'm, girls, ladies, I'm just going to start and um, let you all um, address all these questions everyone had. Awesome. Okay, let's just start with what are some supplements that you consider worth a shot? Creatine, magnesium, collagen, which ones are worth it? I'm going to lead the stage because I know Ellie and I are going to be in the same mindset here. If you are someone who can honestly say, look, looking at their life objectively, and you can say, hey, I am doing all of the things, right? I am eating a diet that is high in protein. I'm getting in three to four servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I am prioritizing strength training and getting a, a step goal every day. If you're covering all of those bases, I then think we can talk about supplements. But if you are someone who has yet to even incorporate protein at a meal, let's start there. So let's not start yeah. with the supplements. So I'm laying this foundation. When we're talking about supplements, we're looking at the person who we've already addressed everything else in their lifestyle that they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And now supplements are the icing on the cake. So this is not where we start. Ellie, I'll let you talk about creatine, but I will say in regards to magnesium, if you are a perimenopausal woman or even in menopause, this is one of the most helpful supplements to take. And I know there was one specific question that talked about what type, because you will see there's a variety of magnesiums on the market. Anytime you can get a magnesium glycinate or biglycinate, that's going to be the best one because that is the form of magnesium that is most receptive by our bodies to actually do what we want it to do, which is kind of downregulate our stress. Any other types of magnesium have more negative side effects. Like you might say you have diarrhea. That is not a side effect of this type of magnesium, which is a, another pro. So I would say magnesium to me is in the worth a shot bucket. If you are having some symptoms from perimenopause, like maybe you are feeling stressed or anxious, or you're having trouble falling asleep. That's another thing that people tend to happen with perimenopause is sleep becomes an issue. So any dysregularities in sleep or stress, I would say magnesium is definitely conducive to helping you with either of those problems. Can you both just share, because I know a lot of people are probably like I am, just tell me which one to buy. I don't want to get on Amazon and spend hours. So like the creatine I'm taking, Ellie, just I said, tell me which one. And that's what I use because y'all have done the research. So can we, can you share links or if you have a link to share, would you allude to that? Where if someone may be driving and think, Ooh, I want to check those show notes out because she recommends, or there'll be a link to this or that. Yes, I, I can speak to two companies right off the bat that I really, really trust their product. That is Garden of Life. They have really good supplements and also Thorn. And, and Thorn is one that I will stand by time and time again because I've used many of their products. And so I know- I have their magnesium. Yes, and, and it's one of them that if you buy a cheaper magnesium, you will not actually get the benefits from it because we want something that I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, but methylation is one of the biggest things that we want it to do within the body. And if, if a supplement ha is not in its methylated form, it actually doesn't do what we want it to do within the body. And so yeah. you're going to pay for a supplement that is a better quality, but yeah. I will say thorn is one of the ones that I will stand by time and time again. Yeah. And mom, I have I a, it's, it's in powdered form and I put <laughs> it in tea at night. So I will definitely, I know exactly which one I'll link to that. It yeah. gets rave reviews, rave yeah. reviews. I sent it to you, mom. It's, but you also have it, but it, yes, like Gina said, you want the, the glycinator, the, the bis glycinator, however you say it. And that's the one that the thorn has. So generally too, just as far as like, again, like we're not doctors prescribing anything, but generally they come in like 200 milligram servings. So just to speak to like women specifically, one thing I found that's like really helpful if you are a woman who is currently menstruating, like in the sense of like you haven't been through menopause or had a hysterectomy or anything. If you do experience a lot of like PMS symptoms, then 
if you are already at baseline taking magnesium, like 200 milligrams per day, it can, and it has been shown to be helpful to increase magnesium a little bit above 200 milligrams when you're experiencing a lot of PMS symptoms. Because even just if you think about like contraction of the uterus causing a lot of mm-hmm. you know, cramping and pain, yeah. like Gina alluded to, magnesium can help just relax the system. And so a lot of times some women experience like a decrease in menstrual cramps when they're consistently taking magnesium, but then right before symptoms get really bad, increasing the dosage just a little bit. So oh, that's wonderful. That's super helpful. And I'll, I'll just say this really quick to you. Like you said, I, I talked specifically to perimenopause and menopause, but if someone is still having a regular cycle, it does help normalize progesterone, which is the primary hormone that increases after you ovulate. And so typically what happens to you with progesterone, if, if the balance between estrogen and progesterone is not in line with one another, you tend to have more adverse symptoms of PMS. And so that's another way of how magnesium helps is because it actually aids in the action of progesterone, which alleviates some of those PMS symptoms too. But yes. And then the only, the other thing too, that I will say can be in the worth a shot bucket is speaking to men, um, menstruation and PMS symptoms is potassium that also has been shown to help with specifically cramping, but some of the PMS symptoms. So again, just to, fi- to put a cap on this, the, the rocks that we put in the jar are going to be your, your protein intake, your strength training, all of that. And then these supplements are the sand that's going to fill mm-hmm. in the gaps. If you do these supplements and spend all this money, but you're not doing the other things, you won't even really notice the benefits truly of those, mm-hmm. of the, it's just such a marginal gain that you're only going to really notice it once the other rocks are in place. So creatine, I've recently done a big series on our Instagram. You can find it on a little story okay. bubble. If you want to go reference oh, yeah. nutrition creatine, um, it's a highlight, but I answer a lot of questions there. I will say a few things to preface. People's biggest concern with creatine is that it's going to harm kidney function, that it's unsafe, that it's a steroid, all this stuff. Creatine is the most well-researched supplement out there right now. And it is proven time and time again to be completely safe in healthy individuals who do not have pre-existing kidney issues or um, anything that would obviously talk to your doctor, but creatine is safe and studied and extremely effective. So I will say that again, if you're doing all of the big things that creatine supplementation is definitely in the worth a shot bucket for women, for men, for age groups across the board in healthy individuals, it can help with uh, skeletal skeletal muscle mass, um, hypertrophy, strength, power. It's going to help you go longer in your workouts. It's going to delay fatigue so that you're going to have a more effective workout, which in turn is going to help with body composition, just all of the positive benefits of a better workout. So all that to say, I think everyone should be taking creatine. One of the things you want to look for in creatine is a creatine monohydrate. So mom, I, you already have the link of the one I sent you. I'll put it in the show notes and I take one every morning and I give, put it in your dad's coffee and mine. It's just one, the scoop, a little scoop, five grams. Is that right? Yep. And it's actually absorbed better in a hot liquid, even though it's going to be fine in a cold liquid. Yeah. Uh, But it has been shown to be absorbed better. So if you put it in your coffee, then that's even better. Okay. Well, and I know we addressed this on another podcast, Ellie, but can you just quickly hit collagen? Because I do love my vital proteins just because you can't taste it and it doesn't do the protein stuff, the frothy. It's just sort of, I don't know. It's just a different composition. Gina, I'll toss that one to you. Yes. Um, so Ellie and I did a, a podcast on this. So if you want more details, I would say that is definitely a resource to use. Cause I'm going to just hit it really quick. Okay. Collagen to me. And I think Ellie would agree is not entirely necessary. I would probably say if you have collagen and you enjoy it, totally fine. If you're someone whose budget is tight, you can get your protein through whole foods and it's going to be more beneficial because collagen is not a complete protein source. Mm-hmm. And so it does not have an entire amino acid profile. So you would actually be better off getting your protein from a complete protein source. However, it's not a bad thing if you are also eating different meats with your meal. So if collagen is helping you get to your protein at the end of the day, you're still eating whole foods and you just really enjoy putting it in your coffee and not tasting it, go for it. 
if you're someone who is looking to maybe save money and not spend it on a supplement, it is not necessary. So it's one of those where like creatine, I would say definitely do it if you can. Mm -hmm. Collagen, I would say do it if you like it, but if your budget is tight, don't worry about having to buy it and in, in, in doing it because it's trendy right now. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And I'll link to all, all of the podcasts that we allude to. We'll link to those as well. And yeah. the show notes for, for people who want to dive deeper. Okay. I'm going to lump uh, these next two together. Does it matter if you do cardio or weights first? And there's also such a thing as too much cardio. Let's just give us your best, most concise rundown of what we need to be doing. I do strength, functional, whatever, but tell us, especially for women, what we need to be doing and what priority. Okay. So I'll start off with the, is cardio and strength training? Okay. Yes. It, there, there is minimal effect of combining it's called concurrent training. So doing both cardio and strength training at the same time, if that is more effective for you time-wise, totally do it. I will say for probably both guys and girls, but specifically for females, it's more important or the priority should be on that strength training. So I would say if you are going into the gym, planning to do both a strength training and cardio session at the same time, get your strength training done first, because chances are after cardio training, you are going to feel more tired. You get to your strength training and now your intensity is quite a bit less because you can't lift as heavy because you're tired from that cardio training. So again, you can do them at the same time. The priority should be on your strength training. So when you're looking at just training for general health, I think this is where the differences can come in and it becomes extremely individualized. But if you're someone who's just looking to improve your health, there have been studies that show one hour of cardio training and one hour of strength training per week has been shown to improve your risk of all-cause mortality, which if you think about that in terms of breakdown per day, that is very minimal. You're looking at 10 minutes. And so this is one of those things where people think they have to be crushing themselves in the gym six days a week for two hours. And that's just not the case. I will say that hour is not an aesthetic goal. That's a health goal. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking to improve aesthetics, it's going to be a bit more intensive than that. So just, and, and I'm going to throw out a blanket recommendation based on research, but if you're starting from nothing, this is going to seem like a lot. If you're already starting out training, you probably could err on the side of a little bit more, but anywhere from three to five strength training sessions per week is really the ideal amount, especially for females going through perimenopause. And the reason for this is because as we age, just by nature of getting older, we decrease muscle mass. And so the number one thing for a female getting older and going through menopause is maintaining current muscle mass because we also know that muscle mass directly impacts how many calories we burn. And so we want to maintain our muscle mass so we can sustain a higher BMR, but also maintain a higher quality of life. So it's not just all about calories. It's also about living a life that you can enjoy the things you want to do. And so strength training is going to be the one way we can maintain our muscle mass as we get older. So I would say the priority of strength training, mm -hmm. cardio definitely should be part of a routine, but it is, again, you could do an hour and have the health effects, the, the cardio protective effects that most people want from that form of training. Okay. And I'll just toss this out and Ellie's proud of us, but Zane and I just joined a, it's I, Ellie, would it be functional fit? And what, what would you call torque? Oh, you're for sure. High intensity training, functional fitness, strength yeah. training. Yeah. And he does incorporate the echo bike or the, or whatever to get a little heart rate, or we have to run, run around the building or whatever. But I will say just from, as you get older, the investment of money and time, it, it's worth it. Otherwise, you know, you can't pick up your grandkids possibly, or you'll, you know, throw your back. So I do appreciate that. And I just encourage everyone find a place that you love because unless you're an anomaly, you won't do all that at home unless you've got, you know, accountability. So I think that's great. If you're injured, you still need to work out and just modify. A hundred percent. Okay. 
it's one of those things where you have to think about the the opposite side of the coin. So your other alternative is not to work out, right? And to do yeah. nothing. And I would argue that is worse. And so I like to use my husband. He's a physical therapist, just like Ellie's. And so he kind of has a rule of thumb where if your pain does not go up three points on a pain scale, then it is okay. Now, if you have, you know, a knee that you need surgery and probably need to be a little bit more careful about that. But if it's just something that kind of irritates you, if you do a move and it doesn't just shoot up in pain more than three points, chances are it's okay. And so it's one of those things that it's definitely going to be taken on an individual basis, but for the most part, movement is always going to feel better than not doing something. And there's something you can do if it's walking great, right? So just find something you can do. It's hopefully just a season where you have an injury, but movement is always going to be better than nothing. Okay. And I will ask this question because um, of the intensity, like our workouts are never over in an hour and it's usually an hour and 15. It's like multiple rounds of, you know, really um, heavy weights and all that. And I'm always hurting. I'm always sore. Is that normal for some people, especially as they're getting older? And maybe you just take like what I do is I do every other day, three days a week, because the next day, oftentimes I can't even sit down on the toilet. I mean, is that normal? I, are you just starting out? Like, is this within the first few months or has it been a while? I yeah, would well, you you have you've been doing Pilates you just started to work <laughs> okay yeah yeah that's true I, I would, I, no I'm in my second so I've done I've done 10 or 11 over the course of the yeah so I would say that's normal for someone starting out any new type of exercise so even like if Ellie or I went and tried some random form of fitness, we would probably be really sore at first because we have not done that before and our muscles really haven't received that adaptation. So for you, if you're just starting and some of these movements are newer to you or oh. it's the first time you've done so much weight, then you will feel fairly sore. I just want to say soreness is not always an indicator of a good workout. Just because you're nine out of 10 sore does not mean it was a great workout. And just because you're you know, three out of 10 sore doesn't mean it was a bad workout. So soreness is a byproduct of tearing your muscles down and having to recover that, which will happen more in the early stages. As mm. you acclimate more to training, I would hope two months from now, if we talk again, you would say, Hey, I'm not nearly as sore. I can do two days in a row. And I don't feel like I'm bedridden for the weekend. Oh, okay. So it does get better. That, that is the goal. Yep. And, and Good. again, it comes to recovery too. So making sure you're recovering with sleep and hydration and protein and all of those things. Okay. Okay. Is okay. Someone asked, is there such a thing as too much cardio? Um, definitely. Yes. There's too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And so for everyone, this is going to look a little bit different based on how trained you are. So I don't really have a blanket number. That's like, if you do three hours of cardio, that's bad. I do know based on the research, any more than three hours of cardio, you don't have any more positive effects. So three hours is kind of the cap. Three where, hours a day? No, a week. Sorry. Three hours a oh, week. Of cardio. Three hours a week. Okay. Yeah. Three wow. hours a week of cardio training. Any more than that, you don't have any more positive effects. You just kind of plateau off. So huh. it's, it's like, why would you do more if I'm not really receiving any effects? And now I'm taking time away from other things that I could be doing. So that's the high end or cap of the cardio training where you see the benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's interesting. And here's the thing too. I want to, I think that's like such a good point because that's like formal cardio. So like going and doing some type of formal cardio, but like, if you still like, obviously you do more if you want to, and you enjoy it, but you know, you could go play tennis, go play pickleball, go do like you you can still get cardio in other ways that aren't like formal cardio on mm -hmm. top of like nailing that three hours per week. And mm -hmm. what you'll find is you probably feel better overall as well. And not so run down. Like, and I, I think you just also have to take into account like central nervous system, fatigue if you're just running yourself into the ground with a ton of cardio all the time you actually might end up feeling worse even though you're doing more cardio or more fitness we associate that usually with like sometimes feeling better or feeling better about ourselves because we worked out you know 
Um, so yeah, minimum effective dose is something I think that's important to consider, especially if you don't love working out. <laughs> okay. What about those of us who might think that walking is cardio? What do you, what kind of walking qualifies? Does it have to be a certain pace, a certain length of time, heart rate? What determines it, making walking cardio? I, I would say, again, it depends on your training status, but it's, it's something that is brisk for if we're looking at health purposes, so like heart protective purposes, like per the ACSM, so the American College of Sports Medicine, a brisk pace is really around three miles an hour. So that that to me is not even entirely fast. So you receive quite a bit of benefit from really not feeling like you're exerting yourself that much. And that's why I think Ellie and I love walking so much. And Ellie, I was just going to piggyback off what you said if you are doing a ton of cardio, you'll find your hunger levels go up substantially. So if you're trying to lose weight, people tend to think, oh, I have to do all this cardio and they go kind of psycho on us. And it's like, hey, you might be doing yourself a disservice because if you're doing three or four hours of cardio a week and your hunger's through the roof, now we're having to navigate, okay, how do we figure out how we can minimize this hunger while still losing weight? And then you're just miserable. No one wants to be hungry all day and have to fight off the hunger pangs. So sometimes we like to do the minimum effective dose of cardio training in the gym and then supplement with walking or other outdoor activities that don't really, you know, increase your hunger as an intense biking session would. Everyone's super different, but like for me, if I do a strength training workout, I'm not hungry. Like I'm really not super hungry after, but if I do like a zone two effort bike for 30 minutes or run, I am ravenous. So Mm -hmm. you just kind of have to know yourself. And then it's an uphill battle. Like Gina said, if you're hungrier and you're trying to just like burn off more calories from doing more cardio, you're better off just, you know, being minimum effective dose for your cardio, doing strength training and just eating more at a level a hunger level that's not like ravenous. So, Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. That's great. We had a lot of questions about menopause management and and when they say menopause or perimenopause, of course, they mean the symptoms. What's your best advice on minimizing the symptoms of the menopause seasons? I think the first thing people think of, I don't want to say weight gain is a symptom, but The common thread I hear with menopause is that females tend to gain weight and specifically in the abdominal region. And and that is really time and time again, what I hear. And so the first thing we have to do is again, look at their lifestyle. What are you currently doing? Because a lot of people haven't been honest with themselves in terms of what their days look like now compared to 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, they may have been chasing kids around in the backyard and having to pick up toys and do all this laundry. And now they don't have kids at home. So they just find themselves more sedentary, which isn't a bad thing, but again, that will attribute to some of that weight gain. And so the first thing that I like to kind of talk about with my clients is have a discussion around what really, what does your day look like? And so then we start with what their day looks like and make small tweaks from there. So maybe they have a step goal now of trying to increase from 4,000 steps to 6,000 steps, or maybe they have no idea how many steps they take Mm -hmm. and we just monitor them and they thought they were taking 8,000 and they were taking two. And so now there's a big discrepancy between what they thought they were doing and what they're actually doing. So I think the first step is kind of being realistic with people and setting up the expectations of this is what you thought you were doing but here's where we actually are and how can we kind of swing the pendulum back to where you thought you were. And so trying to manage number one, the weight gain that way. Cause I know that I know that people want weight loss and I want to help them get that result. And sometimes it's just small modifications of what they're currently doing. Some of the symptoms that they're currently having, whether it be hot flashes or insomnia and mental fog where they can't recall things, Those are all very common and most of them are attributed to estrogen because estrogen has an impact on our brain where it actually helps us recall things. And when that decreases, now all of a sudden we have this brain fog we can't really explain or anxiousness. And that's where we really have to go back to what we first talked about. Are we hitting the big stones properly? Are we doing all of those things right? Because 
Yes, there's going to be a distinct difference between a perimenopausal woman and someone who has a normal cycle. But at the end of the day, we really should be doing a lot of the same things in terms of steps and protein and nutrition. And then we talk about supplements. So that's where magnesium comes. And that's a huge help for people going through perimenopause. Zinc is another one that tends to help people manage symptoms a bit better. And there's a lot of research. The thing with perimenopause is there's not a lot of conclusive research out there about supplements, but if you've heard of ashwagandha, it's Mm -hmm. something that also helps with stress that has been shown to, to help alleviate some of the hot flashes, but this is ultimately where hormone therapy does come into place. If you are Mm -hmm. someone who has all of those big stones checked off the list and you're doing all of those things, right? Sometimes that is the best solution. Because we have to look at also what happens in the brain with dementia. And so hormone replacement therapy can also help with the delay of onset of dementia. Mm. So again, that's where I can't give specific advice. I can just help you with the overall lifestyle piece and help you incorporate more foods that make you feel back to your normal self, give you energy, lessen the brain fog, hopefully get you some better sleep. And then if we need additional help beyond that, that's where hormone replacement therapy could be helpful. Mm, Good. That's good. Okay. We did have, I want to, we've got a few more to hit hair thinning. And then someone even uh, said is B a B complex shot good for increasing hair growth. So just speak to hair thinning. I will say this. So I have had a client who was not even perimenopausal and she did not have a hair condition that like alopecia or anything that made her lose hair but she came to me and said my hair is falling out all the time and we I looked at the initial consult just walk me through a day what you normally eat all this stuff she was severely under eating in general but then also un by nature of under eating she didn't get enough protein she didn't get enough omega-3 fatty acid she didn't get enough complex carbs fiber all that stuff So if you're someone who is just by nature under eating all of the good stuff that we get vitamins and minerals and things that are precursors for, you know, healthy hair growth or just even healthy hormones in general, you're missing out on that. So once we just got her on a program of eating balanced meals at breakfast, lunch, and dinner with a protein, a carbohydrate, a fat, and a veggie. Not at every single meal. She didn't have to have a veggie, but you know, two out of the three, ideally she stopped losing her hair. (laughs) And that Mm. wasn't even, that wasn't even necessarily perimenopausal because she wasn't in it, but Mm. it was just so, it was a testament to the fact that like, you don't need to stress about taking every supplement under the sun. First, I want you just to like, look at your day and Mm -hmm. check off, check off the four boxes of the, the protein, carb, fat, and veggie at your meals. And then by nature of that, you're going to cover so many of the vitamins and minerals that in macronutrients that are necessary for healthy skin, healthy eyes, healthy hair, all of that. And just as a little encouragement, when it can be super stressful hearing us talk about like zinc, magnesium, all these things. And you're like, how do I supplement with it? Just to give you and be, be uh, 12 shots or whatever that um, lady asked about. There, I have a list of, of different vitamins and minerals and the key foods that will supply that for you. And if I just go down the list, it's potatoes, chickpeas, bananas, leafy greens, fish, dairy, beef, chicken. So if you are eating things from the ground or from an animal that has a mother or even like an egg or whatever, you're going to be the ground or it has a mother. What's that? Qu- eat things from the ground or that have a mother. Yes. Like a live food, like any yeah. type of like yeah. food that could that's gonna expire. You are getting B6, B9, B12, magnesium, calcium, manganese, um, potassium, zinc. You're getting all of these things we're talking about. So again, mm. like when you hear us say balanced diet, like I know it can sound like a broken record, but truly like don't stress about supplementing with everything. If, if you're eating nuts and seeds and veggies and meat and dairy products, you are going to get it. So all that to say, try that first um, before you, you know, go get a shot for like, you know, B12 or whatever. I think something just that's important to point out is a lot of people in your generation, correct me if I'm wrong, but at some point, like a low fat diet was really popular. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. It was low fat for a while. Okay. So um, I think that stigma still remains with a lot of people, but um, omega-3 like fatty acids 
it, that is so important for healthy hormones. Mm -hmm. And so I think just by nature of people trying to stay away from fat, thinking it makes them fat, we don't get a lot of omega threes through our diet and the standard American, like Western diet, we get a ton of omega six, but very little omega three. Mm -hmm. And the ratio is so far off. And so really what I think could help for a lot of people with like hair thinning um, is really focusing in on those omega-3. So adding in walnuts to your Greek yogurt parfaits or your oatmeal, adding in a cold water fish, mm -hmm. um, maybe once a week would be a realistic goal. So like a salmon, but then yeah, it, it, healthy hormones come, are made, our hormones are uh, synthesized from fat. And so like, if you're not eating any fat in your diet, because you think it makes you fat, then your hormones are going to suffer specifically your sex hormones. So, which would be like progesterone and estrogen and all that and testosterone. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And you, That's what I'm okay. Should, what do you think about intermittent fasting? And that sort of goes into another question about, should you eliminate dairy and gluten to lose weight? So tie all those together. Yeah, I think is, is the, I guess I should specify, is this pertaining to weight loss? Like is the goal weight loss is the goal health? What would be the That's, goal? Whenever I've done, well, you know, there's weight loss. The lady that asked the question said, is it necessary for weight loss? Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I've always done that to try to maintain and I, I don't always do it every day, but I try to keep the window as broad as I can just you know, to try to maintain. Cause if I hit the ground and start eating in the morning, I just sort of, you know, eat. Yeah. And I think, so I'll start off by this and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but if the goal is weight loss, like the lady in the question had with the gluten and dairy-free diet, mm -hmm. no, you do not have to eliminate either of those things in order to lose weight. When we're thinking about just weight loss, we like to speak to specify and say fat loss, right? Because usually losing muscle is not the goal. It's usually losing fat. And so if fat loss truly is the goal, it's all about the calorie deficit. So if eliminating, you know, a food group helps you get into a calorie deficit and feel sustainable, I guess sure do it. But to me, that doesn't seem like it's something sustainable. And so that's why as nutrition coaches, Ellie and I come alongside of people and we look at their life as a whole and figure out where we can not necessarily remove things, but maybe switch things. How can we alter what they're currently doing? We like to do like more of an addition mindset. Like what can we add into your day to mm. help you reach that goal? Not what can we eliminate to make you feel miserable? Because usually what happens is when you tell people to get rid of this and get rid of this and it's a lot and it's overwhelming. So we kind of do, what can we add in to help maybe get you more of those fruits and vegetables, not eliminate the ice cream cone. Cause if you're eating more fruits and vegetables during the day, you might not be hungry enough for that ice cream uh -huh. cone or whatever it is at night. So in terms of weight loss, no, you do not have to eliminate certain food groups with intermittent fasting and weight maintenance. I would say for a lot of people, intermittent fasting has been successful because it does put parameters on the time of day when you can't eat and when you have to stop eating kind of like an open kitchen, closed kitchen mindset. Mm -hmm. For some people, this is extremely helpful. Like if that, if you feel like it is doable, my mom is someone who has been doing intermittent fasting also, and it has helped her maintain her weight. It doesn't bother her. Then I would say that's totally fine. You should do it. If I was asked to do intermittent fasting, I would be atrocious to be around. So I know that that is not something I will be doing because it's not sustainable for me. So again, weight maintenance is from a, a calorie amount at the end of the day that is in balance with what you've expended. And so mm -hmm. if that intermittent fasting framework helps you maintain your calorie allowance, awesome. It's not necessary though. You could eat all day long and if you're at that maintenance level, your weight will stay stable. Mm -hmm. So are you basically saying calories in calories out as far as just from a weight? I know that's not healthy necessarily, but it yes. all boils down to calories in calories out. Yes. I was just going to say, say your little tagline about like calories determine your X macronutrients determine your X, all that. Oh yeah. Calories determine your body weight. So what your body weight is, is solely based on your calories your macronutrients. So the breakdown between your carbs, your fats, and your proteins determine how you look, right? If you have a total discrepancy between like, you don't eat any protein, 
chances are your muscles aren't going to be defined since protein is the building block for our muscles. So macronutrients determine how you look, but then the micronutrients. So the vitamins and minerals and all these things we're talking about right now determines how you feel, because if you're eating a diet high in protein, but you're not eating any fruits and vegetables, you're going to see some negative consequences. Like maybe your hair's falling out. Maybe you are patient, constipation, <laughs> maybe you have brain fog. So it's, mm-hmm. it's overall your calories determine your weight, your macronutrients determine how you look and then your micros, how you feel. That's, that's great. That's great. I know the importance of protein and I try very hard to get it in. Let's see it, over a, most women need at least a hundred grams per day. Is that right? Whether they work out or not. Okay. Does it matter? Like if you work out, do you need more it, The two people, women, same weight, one works out, one doesn't, do they both still need the same amount of protein every day? I, I would say my blanket recommendation for people for protein is a minimum of 0.7 grams per pound of body weight, and then up to one gram per pound. Now, the person who's strength training would probably want to err on the side of a gram per pound because they are undergoing more stress to their muscles and they need to rebuild them. But Ellie, I don't know if you've seen studies recently where they've shown people who don't strength train, but still eat a high protein diet. They still have actually improved muscle growth, which is absolutely bizarre to me. So I would argue that a high protein diet is beneficial for anyone, regardless if they're training or not. But it all, again, determines what are you starting from? If you're eating 25 grams of protein a day, I'm not going to tell you to eat 125. That's crazy. So where are you starting from? Let's get up to 0.7 grams per pound if you're starting at the bare minimum. And ideally, we want to see up to one gram per pound. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. um, I will say too, just it's cool because like when Gina and I work with individuals, we can figure out um, based on their calorie allowance that they have if we're doing that approach um, and based on their goals, then you can use that range, Gina just referenced of 70% of body weight all the way up to a gram per pound of their body weight or even more to to help with sustainability. So if one person feels really good on high protein because it keeps them so full, then Mm -hmm. we like to push them there, right? Because they're going to not be hungrier and make bad like emotional decisions when Mm -hmm. it comes to food. But then also some people need to be eating the minimum protein, like around 70%, because from a sustainability purpose, they do really well when they can add in more carbs and fat in their diet and not have like the optimal amount of protein taking up a majority of their calories, which is really hard to sustain just like over the course of their whole life. Like people, people gravitate to carbs and fat, you know, so it's just something that's on an individual basis. That's kind of how Jean and I work. We figure out what works best for the person and, you know, the minimum amount that they need in order to sustain it for their goals. Okay. Well, I want to ask y'all this, cause there may be many people like this. I have a friend and she's about to have a baby and she loves food, but she does not like protein. She just wants carbs. What can you entice just carb lovers who don't like meat? They don't really like protein. What's the most appetizing thing for those people that will get in some protein just for the protein averse? How do you, what's the best you can give them? Is is she meat averse or is she just like loves carbs? A little bit of both. She's it's always salad and carbs and I'm, I'm going to get her to eat protein, but I can't figure out what's great. Like I would say do a really Greek yogurt with throw in some Biscoff. I mean, I do that. The, 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 you know, that's not healthy, but it makes the protein palatable. Um, But y'all may know because you work with people and you, people who have different dietary preferences or the people who don't like protein, where do you find the most success in getting them to, is it a, a protein powder or a smoothie or a. Gina, I'll let you, uh, speak to this too, but I do want to say real quick, there's excellent plant-based protein sources. Edamame is a good one. It has carbs as yeah. well. So it's a combo food, but yeah. edamame, um, even, even nuts, even, um, even if you like tofu, um, there's a bunch of, or if you like fish or eggs and, mm-hmm. and even dairy products like cheese sticks and, um, 
Greek yogurt, like you said, cottage cheese, the good culture brand is an excellent, it, it's so trendy right now. Yeah, um, it is. Everybody loves it. Yeah. I, I've got about five packs in there and I will say this, I'll throw out something and then I'll, I'll, I don't mean to interrupt. You would be surprised if you will get, and I know they're not healthy, salting crackers, the good old fashioned salting crackers and dip them in cottage cheese it's magic. I don't know what it is. I could eat that for a meal. So that's one I'll throw out. Pardon? It tastes like you're eating something really, you know, it, it just works. But Ellie, go ahead and say what so, you're all, say. The only other thing I was going to say is what I have seen in so many clients is people who say I'm a person who craves carbs all the time. Like I believe them for sure. But if we go and do some digging, that intense craving and desire for carbs typically always is tied to an under eating of protein. So if we can get them eating just enough protein, then what we see is those cravings for carbs actually go down mm -hmm. because from a blood sugar perspective, protein and healthy fat stabilizes your blood sugar. And so you find that, Hey, I'm not having these massive, like ravenous fits of, I have to have carbs right now. Um, you just stay a little bit more even keel and you can make some more rational decisions when it comes to carbohydrates. Um, so I will say like, if you're someone who just craves carbs all the time and that's all you want, look at your protein intake. And I could almost be willing to bet a lot of money. You're not eating 70% of your body weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was going to say what I try to do with, and I have a client right now that doesn't love meat in general. So it's been extra difficult, but I will always start with, can we find a protein shake, either a pre-made protein shake or a protein mm -hmm. powder that you like? Mm -hmm. And so that's always my step one, because with that, you can get in an easy 30 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I do is, is we kind of play this experiment game. Every, every time we have a meeting, we talk about two protein sources that they're going to try that week. So we'll come up like, okay, maybe I can get her to eat some deli turkey like this past week was deli turkey and ground beef and so yeah. she was going to try both of those and she discovered she likes ground beef if she can put it into a, tor a tortilla I'm like yes yeah. so that's, that's a taco <laughs> yeah yeah anyway it's it's just kind of experimenting and it's it might not be that she doesn't like every source of protein there may be like she's just thinking about chicken or salmon the ones that get thrown out in the health industry a lot yeah but she may like other sources of protein that are a little bit unconventional. So I would say experiment with different proteins. Don't go in with the expectation of you're going to love it or hate it. Just kind of go in neutral. But I will say you can easily get a high protein meal in without a legit full protein source. So I love the protein tortillas that have 12 grams of protein in them. And I also love peanut butter and jelly. If I put two tablespoons of peanut butter in that, that's another eight-ish grams. So that's 20 grams between peanut butter and a tortilla. Can that's you link to those tortillas? And I also want to, because people always ask this, everybody wants to know the, what's the best tasting protein and some want the uh, vegan, some want the other. And Ellie, I specifically emailed you because it's all over Instagram. The, what was it? And you said, well, it's really good. Uh, before I bought it, it started with a K. Oh, the Kachava. Cachava. Is that something? I mean, I, a lot of my friends take it and they love it. They said it tastes like a milkshake. Would that be something good for? I said it was good from a taste perspective. I remember saying it was good from a taste perspective. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I don't, I can't necessarily speak to the macronutrients other than I know it's, it's a bit of a higher fat protein source. Yeah. So I'm linking to the ones that, that I use the vegan okay. and the whey based, um, because I trust the company and you can, I also have a code if you want to get money off, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that you're if you can take a whey based protein powder, W H E Y, that's better just from an amino acid breakdown standpoint. But then if you have to have plant based because it upsets your stomach to eat the other kind, then um, the one that I'm going to link to is the best vegan one that I have tasted yet. Okay, Y'all have one that's non like I love whey. I mean, I do yeah. whey. Yes, yes. And that's ideal. Like I said, it's fast digesting. Y'all know the best one. Like I will tell you, I have one you have to go to smoothie king and get it it's good it yeah. actually tastes good but it's like very expensive and you can't get it anywhere else I don't have a code for like a protein powder like Ellie because I'm not a famous CrossFit athlete like she is but <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I do love Legion they have a great I mean they have an, a, a ton of different flavors 
Um, but if you like to bake with protein powders or do like make smoothies, they have tons, like they have a cocoa cereal and one that's like cinnamon toast crunch milk. And they have just your standard flavors. They have a strawberry banana. So lots of different fun flavors if you wanted to do that for your smoothies. But um, I, my second suggestion was going to be find, and I'm going to say oatmeal again, because I just love it, an oatmeal bake or an overnight oat recipe that you can add protein powder in. Because again, that's giving you those carbs, but also balancing out with some protein. You can add some fruit to it and then you have a perfectly balanced meal and it's giving you the best of both worlds. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. I think we're almost out of time, but let's see. Best, real quick, best exercises for osteopenia. (laughs) I'm going to say strength training in general. There's really not a best exercise. And this is my encouragement to people. I want to say you can't screw this up. Like there's no one best diet. There's no one best exercise. It's if you, if you're suffering from osteopenia or, you know, anything in the perimenopause, postmenopause world, strength training in general is beneficial. So if you have a limitation based on injury or whatever it may be, then yes, you can work around that, but there's not a best exercise to help with osteopenia other than find a strength trainer or coach you love and stick with them. Yeah. Yeah. Last one. Cause I know I've got to go. I'm always tired. What nutrition tips for better energy throughout the day? Ellie, now that's not me. I'm never tired, but someone asked that. <laughs> consider yourself blessed. Um, Ellie, you know, I'm crazy. I'm just always. Oh, <laughs> that's a good thing. No, but you also, I think actually that speaks to something that I was good. That just popped into my head, but I will say something about getting up early, making sure that you eat your breakfast, but that also if you can, and you're a person who can get a workout in early, I think that, um, that ha- your day that goes has- better. Your day goes better. At least for me, I this is, it anecdotal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's anecdotal. I can't like cite a study that says it's better, but I just find that one compliance for working out goes up when you can just knock it out before the stress mm-hmm. of the day, you know, yeah. impact. Um, you, but also even just like starting out your day with breakfast and making sure that you're getting some protein in and, and, um, eating, even if you intermittent fast, like, you know, getting a solid amount of protein in mm-hmm. at that first meal, it, it sets the tone for the day. Like truly you your blood bubble. sugar. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Right. So yeah. And then also too, if you're just look at, be objective with yourself, if you're using caffeine to mask a, a improper balance of your diet, or even just poor sleep in general, if, if, you are relying on caffeine at all. Like you might feel like it helps, but at a certain point, it's just like masking, masking everything. So. Yeah. Well, I will just let everyone know. Cause I've y'all been so kind to stay on this long go. I will link to your website because there's tons of free information there, but anyone who wants to dive deep. And I, I know, um, just because Ellie, I know some of her clients' success stories, and I know you have equal amount that y'all are helping so many people. So you give the consultation and then you can take it from there if you want to dive deeper into all of this. So thank you. And let me just toss this out. Y'all also on your Instagram share great recipes. And I'm my my um, Instagram person is putting out a reel today of Gina's protein laden frosty copycat that's right <laughs> i i kept and it was on your story so it's not on your website so y'all do you want to hey we'll collaborate and you can put it on your website oh yeah go make yeah. us a collaborator yeah. but i did add chocolate syrup <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> so you may not you want to say oh, you can't post it now yeah no, that's okay that's okay no uh, i'm joking no that's- anyway that, it was great it was good so anyway thanks Thanks so much, girls. Y'all were just the best. I appreciate it. Y'all are welcome back on anytime.